if you take the coca leaf and the cola nut and put them together, you build the, one of the world's most valuable brands. These are the ingredients of Coke as we know it today, or at least they were. They used to be the ingredients. So the coca leaf, obviously, with a dubious association with cocaine and the cola nut, these are stimulants. And years ago, when Coke was sold as a tonic, it contained these stimulants. And it was sold in a way to, um, as you would sell medicine today. So the original Coke was sold as a cure for all kinds of illnesses and disease, like you're tired or, you know, you had some sort of stomach upset. And interestingly, the, there is a stomach condition known as dyspepsia. So you, it's no coincidence where you can see where that name went, dyspepsia. So in the early days, Coke and Pepsi both had these ingredients in them. And, you know, I, I remember my mom saying, uh, like, if you had a upset stomach, drink Coke. And um, I, I think it was her dad, actually, that I remember first ever hearing that from. He said, like, if you've got an upset stomach, drink some Coke. So, you know, he would have been born before the Second World War, right? So he, I think, you know, when he was drinking Coke, it, it, at that time, it didn't have these ingredients. But his generation may have inherited that from their parents, you know, maybe the parents of you know, World War One, in the early 1900s, when they bought Coke, maybe it had these ingredients in it. Um, but now they don't, obviously, it's illegal. And now Coke and Pepsi are just fizzy water with sugar and caramel and carbon carbonated water and caffeine in them. They don't have these ingredients anymore. But the, the story of, of what they do is persisted, right? And this is really important for business storytelling is understanding the difference between what you make and what you mean to people. And I want to teach you this today and how you can use this. And there's some simple techniques, and this is not a long lesson. So really just some simple techniques today. To, to understand the science behind it, we have to really understand soda. And the reason why I want to talk about soda is because I think it's the purest form of storytelling because there is nothing to compete over except story i mean you know once we've taken out cola nuts and coca leaves there's nothing it's the same there's the you know i can make a cola you can make a cola lots of people have tried to make colas yeah it might taste better it might taste worse at the end of the day it doesn't matter you know red bull can sell a pretty foul tasting beverage right and sell billions of dollars of it it's not about the taste but years ago, Pepsi, who have always been globally the number two soda to Coke, it varies in different markets, like in India, Pepsi is number one. But globally, Coke is number one. And Pepsi has long struggled with this. It didn't want to be number two. It wanted to beat Coke. So in the 80s, Pepsi launched the Pepsi Challenge. And the Pepsi Challenge, what it did is it challenged customers to a blind taste test. So here you are. Here are two unbranded colas. I want you to drink cola A and then drink cola B and then tell me which cola tastes better. And in the blind taste tests, Pepsi tasted better than Coke. On average, of course, you may think that Pepsi tastes better than Coke. You may think that Coke tastes better than Pepsi. That's individual choice. But on average, over a large data set of customers, Pepsi tasted better. And actually, I've tried this. I've tried drinking Pepsi and then tried drinking Coke, and they do taste different. Pepsi tastes a little bit sweeter, and perhaps that's why we think it tastes better. Coke tastes a little bit sharper, a little bit stronger. But there is a an elephant in the room here that te taste. So we've established that Pepsi tastes better, but Coke sells better. Why is that? It doesn't make sense because if we were buying purely on the basis of taste, then why are we buying the worst uh, tasting 
cola. Doesn't make sense. There's something else going on. And this is a key lesson to take away from storytelling, which I want to teach you now. And the insight to this lesson comes from some neuropsychology, so study of the brain. So neuropsychologists studied this Pepsi challenge. And what they did was they gave students unbranded cola A and unbranded cola B, and they repeated the experiments of the, the marketers years earlier. And they found indeed that Pepsi was preferred over the taste of Coke. However, they decided what would happen if we actually gave them the colas, but they weren't blind they were actually the branded drinks. Would that change anything? So their hypothesis was that maybe what's happening is the knowledge of the brand is actually changing their experience of taste. So they repeated this taste test. And at this time, it wasn't cola A and cola B. It was Pepsi and Coke. And interestingly, what they found was the same colas, but people said they preferred the taste of Coke by a factor of four to one. Think about that. What has actually happened is the knowledge of the brand has changed the neuropsychological experience of the product because the taste has actually changed in their brain. And if there's one thing I want you to take away today in storytelling is that people don't drink the soda they drink the can. And what I mean by that is they consume the whole package. And the whole package is the story. And if we want to break this down for the purposes of being able to use it, this is the difference between content and context. Content, what you make for them, and context, what you mean to them. Of course, you need content. Without content, there is no context. But people don't buy content. People don't buy insurance policies. People don't buy cola. People don't buy smartphones. They buy what it means to them, what it does for them. People don't buy stuff. They buy what stuff does for them. What does this do for me? That's what I'm buying. I'm buying the fact that this protects my family. I'm buying the fact that this makes me belong to a group of people. I'm buying the fact that this helps me connect with my friends. That's what I'm buying, not the content. And what you can do in business storytelling is identify content and context. And I'll show you an exercise in a minute about how you can do this. And once you identify content and context in your communication, what you need to do is obviously you have to have content, but what you're really building in your story is around the context. And there's a reason why we need this more than ever. And this is what is happening around us all today. It's like, you know, if you went to business school, you, they taught you about barriers to entry. You know, you've got barriers to entry, like control of the factors, of production, labor, brand, et cetera, et cetera, distribution. These are all barriers to entry that they taught you in business school. But what's happening now in business is all of those barriers to entry are being destroyed. This is the end of quality. And what I mean by that is that everything now delivers quality. So every supplier has got access to the same distributors, the same products, the same algorithms. There's no better way of seeing this like in the ride sharing market. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here in Singapore, for example, Uber and Grab, two competitors, taxi ride-sharing businesses, have offices right next to each other. I'm sure that they compete for the same people. I'm sure that they've got access to the same knowledge about machine learning algorithms. And in fact, if you go to the hawker centers here in Singapore, where you can buy local food, and it's a very Singaporean experience, you see them all over Asia, these hawker centers. You can go to a hawker center, you can have chicken rice, you can have masala dosa, idli sambar, you can get kopi si kosong, you can get kopi o, tesi, whatever it is. Now, the point is, is you can go there and you can order food via your Grab app or your Uber app, your Uber Eats app, your Grab Eats, or your Deliveroo app, you can get it from the phone. You can Now, I can, whilst I'm talking to you, I can order food. So if I open my app, I open Deliveroo, and I scroll through the app, and here we go. The first, I've got Starbucks here, right? So 15 to 25 minute wait time, I can order 
anything I want from Starbucks. Now, if I was to open the Grab Eats app, and if I open that up now, what I see is that it's exactly the same. If I open up Grab Eats, open up food, there's Starbucks, right? Right there in front of me. So isn't that interesting that all of these companies are on the same platforms and you go to these hawker centers and you can go to uh, the stalls and you actually see the delivery bikes parked outside. And what makes this even more interesting is you, it's the same delivery drivers. They've got two boxes, one for Grab, and one for Uber on the same bike. And it may be Grab, Uber, Deliveroo. They may have three boxes. It's the same delivery drivers. They're picking up the same food and they're delivering to the same customers on the same distribution channel using the same technology. So what is differentiating Uber and Grab? It's not their logos. And Grab and Deliveroo, if you look, probably have very similar. Grab and Deliveroo are both green. Go figure. And this is happening everywhere. It's not just food. It's not just taxis and ride sharing. It's happening in insurance and it's happening in banking and it's happening. Every single industry we thought was untouchable is now being subject to hyper competition where it's less about your ability to open retail stores or less about your ability to get people on the ground or less about your ability to deliver products. It's more about your ability to solve customer problems. The only thing worth competing for. And we are now in this promiscuous, this platform promiscuous world where we used to compete on the basis of a symmetry, meaning that you had access to stuff that I didn't have access to. You had access to information I didn't have access to. You had access to stuff that you dug out of the ground and you built a fence around it. So I couldn't get access to that, right? That's the asymmetry of competition that we've built our businesses around for the last 80 years. And there's no more evidence of asymmetry than in the job market. You know, if you go back hundreds of years in Singapore, you look at, you know, these sort of travelers tales of Singapore from the early 19th century and the street scenes that you would have seen in the 19th century, you would have seen, you know, certain races selling certain things, you know, the Chinese were street hawkers, the you know, the South Indians sold nuts and food on, on the corners and you had the Malays who were porters and carrying and you have like the um, Central Indians who came to Singapore, they would like, offer barbering services to the rich landed gentry. So every race had a different caste almost. And that's been with us for a hundred of years. And you know, when you think about engineers, you think about Germany. And when you think about startups, you think about Silicon Valley. And when you think about bankers, you think about London. But that's all changing now because China is producing many Silicon Valleys. And there are more machine learning engineers in Bangalore than there are anywhere else in the world. And banks can be anywhere. You know, some of the most exciting banks are here in Singapore, these neo banks digital banks, digitally native banks. So asymmetry is dead. You know, the, what stopped an Indian farmer building a $50 million turbine wasn't a lack of resources. It was just a lack of information and know-how. And now, you know, an Indian ag tech company can raise money and create a, a billion dollar startup potentially if they have the right support. So what this means is that all of our business communication for many, many years has been based around content because the content was, we could protect it. We owned it. It was what made us unique. Our, you know, but now there's, everybody's got the same content. You know, you can't sell the ingredients of your product. Nobody cares because I've got access to them as well. I have access to the ingredients you have access to. And if I don't, someday somebody will. 
if you look, for example, at SaaS, like software as a service, uh, great examples that many years ago, there used to be SaaS companies that were in the cloud and their competitors used to be on CD, but not anymore. They're all in the cloud now. So the whole idea of competing on content, i.e. that we are cloud and you are CD, is gone. So what now needs to happen is the business communication needs to upgrade itself and communicate in that form, which is like, okay, we're not going to sell this idea of cloud versus non-cloud anymore because that's gone. We're going to sell this idea of context, which is like, we understand your pain and we understand that we are the better solution. We're creating a better solution for that pain than the next guys, right? Because we have been listening to you and your user storytelling and we are communicating back with data story. So what I want to do now is break this down. So when you're talking to people, when you're presenting, when you are trying to get influence and action in teams, communicating data, um, presenting, you understand the difference between content and context. You take a, take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle. On the left-hand side, put content. On the right-hand side, put context. So content is everything that your product is. It's a policy. It's a cheap policy. It's got good experience. It's online. It's digital. This is all content. This is what it is right? And then context is what it does for people. Like, okay, I trust the guy who's selling it to me. Um, or it speaks to me directly. This this life assurance policy is, is tailored for me. I get it. It's, you know, it's only 10 years. So that's what I was looking for. I was just looking for term cover, right? And that that's exactly what I want. It's not like giving me like 50 years potential span because is that is this for me? I'm not sure. Is this supposed to be for me? Am I supposed to be buying this life insurance? But yeah, this one speaks to me, right? That's context because it solves my pain. And my pain is fear of making a mistake. Like if I buy this product, am I buying the right product? Was it supposed to be for me? So the context is, is that speaks to them exactly, to the direct, speaks to your customer directly. And then what you've got to do in your business storytelling is focus all your energies on context. Focus all your energy on emphasizing the context of what you do and only a, a little bit on the content because that is the part that everybody can copy. But you can't copy the context. You can't copy story. You can't copy relationships. You can't copy individuals. So when you tell your story, I can't copy that. When you share your anecdote of your interaction with your customer, I can't copy that because it's you. Now, so the challenge for us is using this. And I think when you start to see great business communication and communicators, you see that they really understand the power of context and they use it in their communication. And you too can. You can use context in your communication and see the results. And you can also identify poor communication. You can identify people who are just presenting content. If you see that in your team, Pull them up and say, hey, look, this doesn't mean anything to me. You're talking about what it is, not what it does for me, right? I find as well in, in hiring, interesting, if you're in a leadership position, you're, you're hiring a lot, right? And what you should look for in hiring your team is people who understand from the user's perspective. This is a really important, I don't even think this is a skill. This is a personality trait more than anything. You can reveal it to people. Oh, by the way, you need to think about what your customer's thinking. If you reveal it to them and they get it, that's fine. But if you reveal it to them and they don't get it, you've got a problem because all they can communicate is content. They've, they have a lot of difficulty of understanding what other person is seeing from their perspective, what the other person is hearing from their perspective. So content and context is not just about your communication or your team's communication or your brand's communication. It all should be about the skills that you're looking for in the people around you. Do you see those skills of identifying context in your team? Because actually, I'm not sure you can train this. You know, it, it's something inherent in their personality. If somebody can't get it, from the user's perspective, you're constantly having to pull them back and keep reminding them, and they'll just keep gravitating back towards their own worldview. And this, you know, this goes back to the last episode about emotion, emotional intelligence. It's like, you know, data storytelling 
is being able to take content and turn it into context, right? And that is once revealed to somebody, a real test of whether or not their personality can absorb that. Okay, folks. So we're now at the business end of the course. Hopefully that was useful for you and some useful insight. I would say the takeaway from this is to start with this exercise of content and context. Take your product and break it down. What I make for them, what I mean to them, and focus on this last part.